But our foundational scripture is 1 Corinthians 3.11. It says, For no one can lay a foundation other than the one which is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. How many of you know that Jesus Christ is our foundation? There is no other foundation that can be laid because God created all of us and all of this and he set the one foundation in place, amen? But how many of you also know that we can do all these wonderful things in our lives? We can build all these great things. We can invest into all these great things and very quickly realize, oh no, I did not build that on the foundation of Jesus. And guess what happens when we don't build on a foundation of Jesus? It falls apart, y'all. So we are talking about what is the DNA in that foundation of Jesus in this scripture? What is the DNA of Jesus? What is the character of Christ? We've been talking about worship, surrender, sacrifice, compassion. And this week, we are gonna wrap it all up with the DNA of humility. Somebody say humility. Humility. Elbow your neighbor and say, it's time to be humble. You can say that a little with more conviction, y'all. Anybody in here ever been humbled? Anybody ever been humbled? Anybody at all? Yeah, I think, I think all of us have a couple times or two in life. So this last Thursday was our youngest little one's fourth birthday. All of you can say, oh, I know. I know that's him. There he is. Our little fox turned four. He's so sweet. So all day long in the Groves family, when we have a birthday, because there's four kiddos, when we have a birthday in the Groves family, mom really likes themes. So I always have a theme and I always make everybody go along with this wonderful theme. So these wonderful fox ears that Fox is wearing, the entire family got to wear them all day long, which you'll see in this next picture. We were all little foxes for the day, and Fox got to choose everything that we did. So we went to the zoo, and then for dinner, we got to go to his favorite restaurant. He has two favorite restaurants. He loves Mia's, and he loves Lupe's. And we say, Fox, where do you want to go to dinner? And he says, Mia's, Lupe's, Mia, Lupe's, Mia's, Lupe's. He just can't decide. He can't ever decide. But on his birthday, he decided on Lupe Tortilla, and he was so excited. So we all went to Lupe's together, and we had his little birthday dinner, and they sang him his song and his big sombrero. It was so cute. He's always so cute. And after we were done, we were all leaving. We've all still got all our fox ears on, and we're also all wearing, I don't know if you saw in the picture, but little foxes that are in the shape of a heart, you know, because we love our fox. And we're leaving the restaurant, and the kids and I got tripped up and hung up, and so we actually ended up falling back a little further than Daniel did as he was leaving the restaurant. So he was walking out of the restaurant by himself in the fox ears as a grown man, and he didn't notice that we were not walking with him at that moment until he heard a father at a table on the way out say to his two teenage daughters, hey, girls. Uh, never trust a grown man in animal ears. And he looked down and saw the two teenage girls looking up at him like some kind of weirdo. And he realized in that moment, I don't have my children. There's no one to back me up here. I do just look like a strange man wearing fox ears in a restaurant over my hat. We all have humbling moments, right? That was his, because in that moment, he realized, I have nothing to say. This does just look very strange. But when we talk about humility, it's challenging, right? Humility is not something that we really like to receive um, help from others on. Because, you know, maybe it is a little weird for us all to wear fox ears as grown-ups. Even myself. People thought I had colored my hair for the day to go along with my boy. They're so sweet. They're like, oh, you really love this theme. You've colored your hair to look like a fox. And I just say, I sure did, yep. I love looking like a fox too. But this is a difficult concept. It's a tough one. Nobody ever wants to hear, you need to be more humble, right? Nobody wants to hear that. And you wouldn't even admit it right now because when we hear those words, it's because we're functioning in more pride in the moment than we should. So there is no point where somebody saying to us, you need to be more humble, feels good. But the truth is, y'all, we all need to be a little more humble. Amen? Amen. Say it with me. Say, I need need to be more humble. humble. All of us. 
All right, I'm gonna pray for you. Lord, I just thank you right now that as we talk about being humble, receiving humility, understanding the character of Christ and the humility that he functioned in, God, I just pray that you would give us tender hearts to receive and to hear every single thing that you have for us today in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. All right. So I always like to make sure that we are on the same page in what we're talking about. So I want to talk about what this topic of humility really is, because humility, honestly, is anything that pertains to being humble, right? Easy. No problem. But actually, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's simply thinking of yourself less. It's not thinking less of yourself. It's not being down on yourself and discouraged and not having any confidence. It's not being embarrassed of who you are. It is simply thinking of yourself less and less often, making sure that you are not your greatest priority. That is what humility is. We all know that being humble is the opposite of being what? Proud, prideful, arrogant. We all know that. But Proverbs 16, 18 says that pride leads to destruction and arrogance to downfall. Y'all, the truth is pride will simply trip you up. It will trip you up. Anybody in here ever tripped? I trip all the time. Literally, I, you guys, like, like very little of you raised your hand because clearly it's just me that trips quite often. Literally a couple months ago, I was sitting on the front row. We were heading out um, at the end of the service and we were getting ready to go out and meet y'all in the lobby. And my foot had fallen asleep while I was sitting with my legs crossed on the front row. And I stood up to discreetly slip out of the room during prayer and almost fell right over here. And I literally heard someone in this section go, oh, just got up and kept walking because I trip often. When we trip, we get back up and keep going, right? Pride is a little trickier. It is a whole lot more difficult. Why? Because pride will embarrass and humiliate us continually. Nobody ever thinks they're being prideful because we feel justified in moments. We have all these excuses about why we are right. Why what we have to say must be heard. We feel so strongly in these moments. Humility doesn't function like that, though. Humility keeps us steady in our faith, in our relationships. Why? Because it keeps us focused on the right things. Humility keeps us focused on the Lord and what God is doing in our lives, not what we want, what we desire, and what we think should be happening. Amen? Humility is very different. I want you to take a moment. You can close your eyes if you'd like, so it'll help focus you. I want you to think right now about two people. could even just be one person. Two people that you think of when you immediately think of a humble person. Just think for one second. They should have just popped right in your mind. Okay, you can open your eyes. Now, if you were one of those two people, let me just inform you that you are not a humble person, my friend. Okay? We often find ourselves going, no, I actually think I'm pretty good in that area. I think I do, I think I do pretty well. But the problem with pride is that pride will even show up in our humble moments. Amen? Amen, y'all. I am not telling you that you can't have proud moments. I am not, because you should be so proud of your children. You should be so proud of your kiddos, even in their imperfections. Anybody have imperfect kids? See, I should have seen almost all of the parents' hands. We've all got imperfect kids. I'm an imperfect kid, but we should all be so proud of our kids. They should know it. Their, child, their childhoods should be marked by knowing, my mom and dad are proud of me. My mom and dad were proud of me. I always knew that. We should be proud of the successes that we get to experience in life. We should be proud of those moments where we achieved something that was something we had to sacrifice for. Amen? We should be proud of those moments, but we should never be the first to pat ourselves on the back in the midst of them because something very specific happens in that moment when we don't recognize that the glory is never ours. 
The glory is never ours, y'all. When you have a moment that you feel proud of your children in, in that moment, should you stop and go, I did a good thing? No, you should stop and say, God, you did a good thing. Thank you so much for giving me the wisdom to be able to train these children in this moment. Thank you that I get a moment to invest into these lives. When we have successes in our careers or in our lives and we find ourselves feeling like, yes, you did it, should that be our response? No, our response should be, thank you, God, that you allowed me this moment of success and you kept my feet steady. You kept me on the right path. We should be able to point to the right source of praise. Amen? That is not... What, what pride does. 1 Corinthians 1, 28 and 29 says, God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one would boast before him. If you look back in the Bible, you will see that God chose a lot of people in the Bible to use and to do great things through because they would not ever say, I did this. He chose the people he chose because he knew that they would say, that wasn't my strength. If we look at Moses, Moses' first, was, first complaint was, I don't speak well. Lord, you want me to speak to all of these people? You want me to go before the leader of the nations and you want me to speak? And God said, yes, I do. I will give you the words I will tell you exactly what to say because Moses was never gonna boast about it. If we look at Jesus, we look at his life, we look at the humble beginnings of his life, he's the greatest example of humility that we could ever have. And Jesus was born to Mary and Joseph, but we all know Mary was a virgin when Jesus was born, right? That means that Mary and Joseph could never take any kind of credit for how wonderful Jesus turned out. Amen? Amen. And Jesus was born into a manger. That was how he began his life here. Talk about humble beginnings. A manger is literally a feeding trough for animals. That's where animals would go to get their slop, their grain. It was literally made of mud and sticks. That's where they laid this brand new savior. Anybody ever had a baby? Anybody? Anybody in here at all? Where we lay our newborn babies. It's kind of, kind of a big deal, right? It's kind of something that we really want it to be special. We get all the things. We get all the pretty swaddles, the pretty outfits, all these wonderful things because we want that first start to be so significant. God wanted his first start to be humble. He wanted it to be a great reminder of what humility would be for all of us because God desires us to have humble hearts. That's God's desire for us. This may not be a topic that you get excited about thinking about being more humble, but it is the very thing that God desires of us that we would be humble and have humble hearts because he never designed us for personal glory. Y'all let that sink in for a moment. God never designed us for personal glory. He designed us for victory in him. He never designed us to take the glory in our lives. He never designed us to feel as if we had it all figured out. He didn't design us for that. People don't know what to do with that kind of glory. Look at Hollywood, y'all. Look at people in Hollywood. There is all of the fame that they could possibly ever desire. There is all of the accolades, all of the attention, all of the praise. And what happens a huge percent of the time? They buckle and they crumble because people were never designed to carry that kind of praise. All of the glory is the Lord's. Amen? Humility is not thinking too highly of ourselves. Humility is understanding that all good things within us came from God, are a gift of God, are a strength of God, are the kindness of God. So I probably shouldn't be looking at myself saying, oh, you did so great. It is not thinking too highly of ourselves. It's not taking ourselves so seriously. Help all your neighbor and say, lighten up. 
Lighten up a little bit. Stop focusing on ourselves because when we do stop that focus, it allows us to grow in life. It allows us to be able to say, hey, I messed that up, but you know what? I'm gonna try again and God's gonna help me and I'm gonna do better the next time, amen? So often we won't try a second time because we're too worried about whether or not we will fail, but the God inside of us never fails, amen? We have to be willing to grow and say, I've got some room for improvement, amen? And then that allows us to care for people more. When we are more willing to think about somebody else than we are ourselves. Y'all, there are dangers in pride. Very simply, there are dangers in pride. We don't see them until we're too deep into them. Anybody ever, you don't have to raise your hand. Anybody ever been in a prideful moment where you realized, crud, this took me further than I wanted to go. And now I am too deep into something that does not reflect the heart of God. And I need to find a way back to humility because there are blessings in humility. Proverbs 22 verse four says, the reward of humility, that is having a realistic view of one's importance and the reverent worshipful fear of the Lord is riches, honor, and life. Y'all, how many of you have ever confused the word humility with being humiliated? Sometimes when we think of the word humility, we think of being humiliated, right? because they really are quite close. But the difference is, the difference is the biblical definition of humility. When we think about humility, we think about the world's view of humility. We think about the embarrassing side, but that is not how God defined humility. And I wanna give you three different ways that humility brings us blessings, not embarrassment. Amen? Are y'all ready? Okay, number, I, I will not convince. Are y'all ready? Okay, that was better. All right, number one. Number one, humility causes us, this is a hard one, to listen. Humility causes us to listen. All you spouses, keep your eyes forward because this is gonna apply in multiple different ways. If we pay close attention, there is help in this listening factor in our relationship with God first when we listen to the Lord instead of running off in the direction that we wanna run off in and mess up our, our purpose for just a minute, but there's also great help in listening in our relationships with people. There's great help in listening if we choose to listen. Say, I'm gonna listen. I don't believe you. You're gonna listen because in the DNA of a believer is a firm foundation in Jesus. And when we understand what that DNA is of the humility of Jesus, we understand that what comes with that firm foundation when we are building on that firm foundation is healthy relationships that follow. Say, I want a healthy relationship. You can be sitting next to a person that you are in a relationship with and still say, I want a healthy relationship. We all should desire healthy relationships all day, every day, because healthy relationships involve people that listen more than they speak. Healthy relationships involve people that listen more than they speak. That should resonate with every single person in the room. Even if you are a quiet-natured person, you should go, wow, wow, that's, hmm, that's something to think about because the truth is, Jesus said himself in Matthew chapter 11, verse 15, he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. He said, if you've got these, then what should you do with them? You should listen with them. You should hear what is happening all around. Y'all, if we already have all of the answers in life, where's there room for revelation from the Lord? If we already know the right answer, if we already know how to fix a situation, if we already know what everybody else should have done in a moment, then where is there room for the Holy Spirit to correct you? Where is there room for you to be stopped in your tracks? But see, we are so quick to have an answer. We are a society of people that have all the answers at our fingertips. We can find an answer even if we know nothing about it, right? And we think that that makes us smart. 
But often the thing that really makes us smart is our ability to listen. Y'all, do you know what Joseph, the father of Jesus, do you know what his most famous line in the Bible, recorded in the Bible was? You know what it was? It was this right here. It was nothing. No words. Some of you are giggling, but I think it is a very, very powerful point recorded in the Bible. I do not believe for a moment that Joseph never said a word because other men in the Bible that had moments and seasons of being mute where the Lord silenced them for a season, the word says it. The word says nothing about him being mute. The word says nothing about him not speaking at all. I believe in this weighty, weighty season that he was in where he was asked to carry something so heavy and so powerful and so much greater than himself. He chose in that moment to be silent and to listen for what God would have him to do next. And I think that that was what God wanted us to grab more than anything else. Because you see, the the word is full of all of these moments of people. It's not full of their entire lives. It's full of the moments that God wanted us to learn something from. So the father of Jesus, the man that raised him, the thing that God wanted us to see about him, not that he was a weak man by any means, not that he didn't play an important role by any means, but that in a moment of severity, of seriousness, he chose to remain silent. And he chose to listen in that moment. I think that there is so much that we all have to learn from that. Y'all, in order to receive instruction from the Holy Spirit, we have to listen. In order to understand the hearts of our loved ones, we have to listen. In order to become trusted by our teenage children, by our young adult children, our adult children, we have to do what? We have to listen. In order to gain the favor that we pray for, we have to pause and listen. In order to receive grace from the heart of God, we have to listen. It is so very important that we understand how to listen. John 3 verse 30 says, he must increase, but I must decrease. So that means I have to listen. Because humility shows up in our words. Just how much humility you have in your heart, it comes out when you speak, y'all. People will know immediately when you say a word whether or not you have a humble heart or not. Whether or not your heart represents the heart of Jesus, amen? You heard some words coming out of people before and you thought, that doesn't represent the heart of Jesus, amen? Maybe it was you. That's okay, there are moments We all have grace that we can receive when we listen, when we pause and hear from the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.29 says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Yikes. That's some serious instruction on what it is that we're supposed to be saying, right? Because our words create atmospheres. Our words that we speak create whatever kind of atmosphere we are going to be living in. Our words should build faith in ourselves and those around us, amen? Amen. Our words should affirm others' hope in Jesus and they should place confidence in God. But our words should not draw attention to ourselves. Our words should not be praiseworthy of ourselves. Y'all, the gospel is not about you and me. Amen? The gospel is is for you and me, but it is not about us. There There are specific things that our words are on assignment to do. When our words, when everything becomes about us, about what we like, what we don't like, what we really believe is this is about, and what we really just need to say or don't need to say, we become self-focused. And when we are this self-focused, we self-destruct ultimately. Because that's what the word says pride does, right? Pride comes before the fall. Luke 18 verse 14 says, for everyone who exalts himself will be what? Will be humbled because we were never designed for self-worship. 
We were never designed for this. God designed us so specifically for relationship and humility. I wanna speak to your humanity for a second because I want you to understand some practical things. Humility does not require validation. Elbow your neighbor and say, I don't need validated. Oh, you guys said that so quietly, so quietly. Humility does not need validation. As people, we desire to be validated, but that is not the humbleness coming from our hearts. Humility desires to validate others. When you feel a great longing within yourself to be validated, what should you do? You should turn around and find a way to validate somebody else, and you should gain your validation from God alone. You should let him tell you all of the wonderful things about you. And you should go straight to the word to find out what truth really is. Because in our time, truth is very, very questionable to a lot of people, but the word of God has never changed. The word of God has never shifted whatsoever. You will always be able to find your validation in the word of God. Pride invites a fight, y'all. Pride invites one, but humility invites the Holy Spirit in prayer. Sometimes, sometimes when you're facing a great bully in life, you don't have to fight back. Sometimes your silence is you just say, and Holy Spirit, do what you'll do. Do what you'll do and restore and repair and fix. Because we don't need to have words in order for the Holy Spirit to be fighting our battles. Amen? Pride needs to always be heard. Pride needs to be right. Pride needs to win. Humility wants to grow and understand. We were designed for relationship with God and with his people, but in order to do that, we have to walk in humility and we have to listen, listen. Number two, humility embraces the hidden seasons. Humility embraces the hidden seasons. How many of you know what I mean by hidden seasons? Anybody ever experienced a hidden season before? Psalm 1 verse 3 says, he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Y'all have probably heard me tell the story about um, my broken leg when I broke my leg in Papua New Guinea. So I'm gonna shorten it and give you the very, the very abridged version. For those of you that don't remember it or have not heard it, when I was 18 years old, I went on a month-long missions trip to Papua New Guinea. It's that wonderful little country right above Australia. And we were there to deliver medical supplies and we were gonna be hiking into the jungle and these, these people in the jungle had never seen white skin before that we were gonna be encountering. It was gonna be incredible and we were so excited. So as we were hiking over this mountain to head into the jungle on like day two or three of a whole month, I tripped, y'all see the whole tripping, the tripping theme? I tripped. I was probably in pride because I did have one of the heaviest packs and I was going incredibly fast and I was very convinced that I was doing great. And I tripped. I slipped and I fell and I broke my ankle, I broke my leg, I fractured my foot and I was in the middle of the jungle with nowhere to go. It was not amazing. There were five days that I was stuck in a village hut and they could not get me back to our missions base. It was, it was pretty traumatic, but I can promise you what was rising up on the inside of me was a lot of pride in that moment. I was very, very disappointed, but eventually after five days, they got us out and they took us back to our, our missions base, which was a miracle all in of, it, of itself. And for one whole month, I got to stay in that missions home all the way up on a mountain while the rest of my team went out and ministered the gospel and took medical supplies and led people to Jesus and went to schools and taught kids about, about Jesus and went to these incredible waterfalls in this wonderful country. And I got to stay back at the missions home for a whole month and prepare their meals for them while they were gone and clean up um, after them and tidy spaces. And I was cast it all the way up to here as well. So I got to do all of that up on stairs and crutches this whole time, one whole month, y'all. I had the option that I could go home and take some of the team with me. 
So I chose to stay. And while I stayed there the whole time, I did a lot of crying. I did a lot of pouting. I did a lot of fussing because, again, I was still only 18. Somebody should be feeling sorry for me. I'm not getting enough sympathy. <laughs> it was tragic. Thank you. I got a couple awes. But in this moment, when I was literally feeling terribly sorry for myself and crying out to God, asking God, why? Why do I not get to do the great things for the kingdom? Why do I not get to do any of those? I came all this way to do things that really mattered. But instead, I'm making meals and sitting by myself and praying. And I'm all alone. And the Lord revealed some some revelations to me in that moment that I have hung on to for my whole life. He revealed to me, one, that my ambition was greater than my trust in the midst of the pain. That my ambition was greater than my trust. And I was in pain, yes. It was awful. It was an awful scenario. I was black all the way up to my leg. It was, it was terrible. But I was more mindful of what I wanted in that season than I was willing to trust God in that season. He also reminded me that I allowed my pride to determine what was a significant act of service. In that season, I felt really small. I felt really insignificant. I felt like I've got nothing to add because I'm not the one preaching the gospel. I'm the one staying back, taking care of those getting to preach the gospel. Those were the things in my heart, coming out of my mouth, writing down in my journal, and I didn't recognize how ugly they were until the Lord said, whoa, whoa, every act of service in my kingdom is significant. And in that moment, he reminded me that it was only my pride that was tripping me up. Nothing else was tripping me up. It was a joy to get to serve my team. And those that had the opportunity to lead others to a knowledge of Jesus. But I was so stuck in feeling sorry for myself that I didn't see it at the time. I kept having all these conflicts with my teammates because I was continually pouting and throwing fits like, you guys just don't understand. You're doing all the great things. And they're like, Jackie, just move on. We're still here. And it was only the checking of the Holy Spirit that caused me to say, oh, oh, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. I'm wrong. I am wrong. And I need to adjust my mindset. The Holy Spirit reminded me that I was afraid of being weak. I never wanted to look weak because being humble is weakness. That's wrong, right? That's a lie. And in that moment, he reminded me of that. And there was this one little word, this little word that I kept saying that I kept feeling small. And I wrote it in the book of, in the, yeah, at the beginning of my Bible because the Lord said to me in that season, don't be afraid to be small. And he wasn't defining what was insignificant. He knew that that was a word I would understand because he was speaking to my pride in my heart in that moment to say, don't be afraid of being something that you don't define as significant because I define it as significant. Whatever you sow towards me, whatever you give towards me is significant. Psalm 1 verse 3 was the scripture that I kept being reminded of because like we just read, it says, he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. Some seasons are full of fruit and they're big fruit and they're obvious fruit and people can see them everywhere. And some seasons are for your development and for your growth and it's what's happening on the inside. But you have to be able to see that, identify it and recognize it. Because guess what happened? Quite a few years after that, and I was reminded again, I became a mother later on, and I had lots of little children, and I had lots of hidden moments, and all those same thoughts, I'm cooking and cleaning for all these people that get to do all the fun stuff, and I don't get to do any of the great things. I was reminded of all the things I struggled with when I was 18 years old, and God stopped me in my tracks, and he said, do you remember? You remember what you learned in that season in Papua New Guinea about the significance of how you serve in your season? It was so important to me that it changed my heart about being a mother, changed my heart about being a wife, it changed my heart about people all together because I saw them differently when I stopped and I listened. So whatever the season is that you're in, 
Maybe you are in a hidden development season. Maybe you have been passed over for a promotion. Maybe you have had to put some dreams on a shelf. Maybe you are waiting for favor. I wanna encourage you that your significance is found in serving the Lord only. Find your significance there. Find your significance so that you don't try to run ahead with great ambition because if God hasn't called you to it in the moment, then it's not yours anyways. So live where you are and let God do great things there. Amen? Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. The greatest example we could ever have was Jesus. And number three, our final point, humility leads to discipleship. It leads us to discipleship. Discipleship is where we choose to dig in and learn. We choose to recognize, I need to learn more about Jesus so that I can teach other people about Jesus. And in order to do that, I have to live a humble life. Psalm 25 verse nine says, he leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. Y'all, when we are humble, we grow. We ask questions. We position ourselves to say, I don't know everything about this. I need somebody in my life to pour into me. I need somebody to come alongside and grow me into the believer that I wanna be. I never wanna be at a spot where I say, it's just enough. How many of you never wanna be at a spot where you say, I'm good enough? Because that's what pride will do. It'll convince you that you are, you're good enough. But the humility that leads to discipleship will help us to connect to others in relationship. Y'all, that's why we push connect groups so much here. It's why we encourage you to join a connect group. How many of you are in connect groups? That's awesome. That's why we encourage that because two are better than one. And when you link up with others in faith, when you join others in the process of growing in relationship with Jesus, it's easier to do with somebody else that can look at your life and say, now hang on a second, that's not from God. This is the direction you need to go. This is where we need to be heading. Humility will lead us to greater purpose, but pride will divide us. Pride will cause us to say, I don't need to be connected. I don't need anything further. I don't need to know any more about God. I go to church on Sundays. There is so much more that God has for us if we choose humility on a daily basis because humility restores, y'all. I wanna remind you, humility is not an ugly word. It's not an ugly word at all. It's not a word we hear about often though, right? If we talk about being humble, um, we're typically not talking about it in a positive way. But the word of God, Jesus Christ, was the best example that we could ever have of humility. And it was not from a man that wasn't bold. It was not from a man or a person that didn't believe in what was inside of them. No, he knew what was inside of him and he had great confidence because of it. To be humble does not equate to being weak. It's a willingness to grow. It restores and it maintains relationships. It acknowledges others' value and it surrenders to the plans and the purposes of God. Y'all, would you stand to your feet with me today? We're gonna go back into worship here for just a moment before I close us out. But I wanna ask you to just check yourself for just a moment. Right there at your seat. I wanna ask you, how is your humility? How is the humility in your life that you walk in on a daily basis? Where are you in terms of a humble heart? Because a humble heart seeks after God, desires growth, desires change, desires to be Christ-like. This is what a humble heart does on a regular basis. It does not desire just to be right, a proud heart says, I'm good enough and I'm right and I need everybody to know it. But I can promise you there is more in the presence of God. There is more when we choose to be humble as we approach God, when we choose to be humble in relationship. There's more freedom, there's more grace, there is more favor when we choose to be humble before Jesus because it is all found in Jesus, amen?
And it all starts with humility. I wanna challenge you all today to something. Who's up for a challenge? You guys up for a challenge? I wanna challenge you to listen more than you talk. Say, I'm gonna listen more than I talk. That's a good one. If we start right there, we will all be better as people, amen? I also want to ask you to honor the season that you're in. Honor the season that you're in. And thirdly, I'm gonna ask you to connect to people. Find a way to intentionally find people that God has placed in your path and connect to them. You will be more encouraged, more lifted up, more boosted in your faith when you choose to see the people that God has placed in your path. Amen. Do you think we can do it? Think we can take that challenge? Amen. We're gonna enter into worship just one more time very quickly, and then I'm gonna close out the service with y'all. leave you with this passage of scripture. It's Philippians 2 verses 1 through 11 and it says, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, my participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind as Jesus Christ. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Can we say amen and amen and amen and amen. I would ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads in this place. I wanna speak to those of you in here that would say, I, I have yet to surrender my life to that Jesus Christ. I have yet to humble my heart and say, I need a savior and I am not living my life in accordance with the word. For those of you that would like to give your life to Jesus today, for those of you that would like to say, I need Jesus as my Lord, in just a moment, I'm gonna give you an opportunity. You're the first group. The second group is for those of you that would like to rededicate your lives to the Lord today. For those of you that would say, I used to have a humbled posture in service of the Lord, but I no longer do and I want to rededicate my life. If you are either of those two, or if you are the first that would say, I wanna give my life to the Lord today, to be the Lord of my life, or if you want to rededicate your life, would you lift your hands up right now in an act of surrender and an act of submission? I see you back there. Church, can we celebrate? I see you over there. Keep your hands lifted. I see you over there. I see you back there. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. I see you all. I see you in the room. 
can we all just say this prayer together? Can we say, Jesus, right now, I confess you as the Lord of my life. I surrender my life to you. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I repent right now. I turn away from the life I used to live and I humble my heart before you. I ask you, Father, to make me new, make me clean. Thank you for the cross. You are my Lord, you are my Savior, and you are my Father. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Can we celebrate, church?